This is a LibriVox recording. It has been edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Carl Manchester, 2007. God and the State by Mikhail Bakunin Chapter 4. Credo Quad Absurdum I believe in the absurd. I believe in it precisely and mainly because it is absurd. In the same way, many distinguished and enlightened minds in our day believe in animal magnetism, spiritualism, tipping tables and, why go so far, believe still in Christianity, in idealism, in God. The belief of the ancient proletariat, like that of the modern, was more robust and simple, less au goût. The Christian propagandism appealed to its heart, not to its mind, to its eternal aspirations, its necessities, its sufferings, its slavery, not to its reason, which still slept and therefore could know nothing about logical contradictions and the evidence of the absurd. It was interested solely in knowing when the hour of promised deliverance would strike, when the kingdom of God would come. As for theological dogmas, it did not trouble itself about them because it understood nothing about them. The proletariat converted to Christianity constituted its growing material but not its intellectual strength. As for the Christian dogmas, it is known that they were elaborated in a series of theological and literary works and in the councils principally by the converted Neoplatonists of the Orient. The Greek mind had fallen so low that in the fourth century of the Christian era, the period of the first council, the idea of a personal God, pure, eternal, absolute mind, creator and supreme master existing outside the world was unanimously accepted by the church fathers as a logical consequence of this absolute absurdity, it then became natural and necessary to believe in the immateriality and immortality of the human soul, lodged and imprisoned in a body only partially mortal, there being in this body itself a portion which, while material, is immortal like the soul, and must be resurrected with it. We see how difficult it was, even for the Church Fathers, to conceive pure minds outside of any material form, it should be added that in general it is the character of every metaphysical and theological argument to seek to explain one absurdity by another. It was very fortunate for Christianity that it met a world of slaves. It had another piece of good luck in the invasion of the barbarians. The latter were worthy people, full of natural force and, above all, urged on by a great necessity of life and a great capacity for it. Brigands who had stood every test, capable of devastating and gobbling up anything, like their successors, the Germans of today. But they were much less systematic and pedantic than these last, much less moralistic, less learned, and on the other hand much more independent and proud, capable of science and not incapable of liberty, as are the bourgeois of modern Germany. But, in spite of all their great qualities, they were nothing but barbarians, that is, as indifferent to all questions of theology and metaphysics as the ancient slaves, a great number of whom, moreover, belonged to their race. So that, their practical repugnance once overcome, it was not difficult to convert them theoretically to Christianity. For ten centuries, Christianity, armed with the omnipotence of church and state and opposed by no competition, was able to deprave, debase and falsify the mind of Europe. It had no competitors because outside of the church there were neither thinkers nor educated persons. It alone thought, it alone spoke and wrote, it alone taught. Though heresies arose in its bosom, they affected only the theological or practical developments of the fundamental dogma, never the dogma itself. The belief in God, pure spirit and creator of the world, and the belief in the immateriality of the soul remained untouched. This double belief became the ideal basis of the whole Occidental and Oriental civilization of Europe. It penetrated and became incarnate in all the institutions, all the details of the public and private life of all classes, and the masses as well. After that, 
is it surprising that this belief has lived until the present day continuing to exercise its disastrous influence even upon select minds such as those of mazzini michelet quinet and so many others we have seen that the first attack upon it came from the renaissance of the free mind in the fifteenth century which produced heroes and martyrs like vanini giordano bruno and galileo although drowned in the noise tumult and passions of the reformation it noiselessly continued its invisible work bequeathing to the noblest minds of each generation its task of human emancipation by the destruction of the absurd until at last in the latter half of the eighteenth century it again reappeared in broad day boldly waving the flag of atheism and materialism the human mind then one might have supposed was at last about to deliver itself from all the divine obsessions not at all the divine falsehood upon which humanity had been feeding for eighteen centuries speaking of christianity only was once again to show itself more powerful than human truth no longer able to make use of the black tribe of the ravens consecrated by the church of the catholic or protestant priests all confidence in whom had been lost it made use of lay priests short-robed liars and sophists among whom the principal roles devolved upon two fatal men one the falsest mind the other the most doctrinally despotic will of the last century j j rousseau and robespierre the first is the perfect type of narrowness and suspicious meanness of exaltation without other object than his own person of cold enthusiasm and hypocrisy at once sentimental and implacable of the falsehood of modern idealism he may be considered as the real creator of modern reaction to all appearance the most democratic writer of the eighteenth century he bred within himself the pitiless despotism of the statesman he was the prophet of the doctrinaire state as robespierre his worthy and faithful disciple tried to become its high priest having heard the saying of voltaire that if god did not exist it would be necessary to invent him j j rousseau invented the supreme being the abstract and sterile god of the deists and it was in the name of the supreme being and of the hypocritical virtue commanded by this supreme being that robespierre guillotined first the hubertists and then the very genius of the revolution danton in whose person he assassinated the republic thus preparing the way for the henceforth necessary triumph of the dictatorship of bonaparte the first after this great triumph the idealistic reaction sought and found servants less fanatical less terrible nearer to the diminished stature of the actual bourgeoisie in france chateaubriand lamartine and shall i say it why not all must be said if it is truth victor hugo himself the democrat the republican the quasi-socialist of today and after them the whole melancholy and sentimental company of poor and pallid minds who under the leadership of these masters established the modern romantic school in germany the schlegels the tiex the navalis the werners the schellings and so many others besides whose names do not even deserve to be recalled the literature created by this school was the very reign of ghosts and phantoms it could not stand the sunlight the twilight alone permitted it to live no more could it stand the brutal contact of the masses it was the literature of the tender delicate distinguished souls aspiring to heaven and living on earth as if in spite of themselves it had a horror and contempt for the politics and questions of the day but when perchance it referred to them it showed itself frankly reactionary took the side of the church against the insolence of the free thinkers of the kings against the peoples and of all the aristocrats against the vile rabble of the streets for the rest as i have just said the dominant feature of the school of romanticism was a quasi-complete indifference to politics amid the clouds in which it lived could be distinguished two real points the rapid development of bourgeois materialism and the ungovernable outburst of individual vanities to understand this romantic literature 
the reason for its existence must be sought in the transformation which had been effected in the bosom of the bourgeois class since the revolution of 1793. From the Renaissance and the Reformation down to the Revolution, the bourgeoisie, if not in Germany, at least in Italy, in France, in Switzerland, in England, in Holland, was the hero and representative of the revolutionary genius of history. From its bosom sprang most of the free thinkers of the 15th century, the religious reformers of the two following centuries, and the apostles of human emancipation, including this time those of Germany, of the past century. It alone, naturally supported by the powerful arm of the people, who had faith in it, made the revolution of 1789 and 93. It proclaimed the downfall of royalty and of the church, the fraternity of the peoples, the rights of man and of the citizen. Those are its titles to glory. They are immortal. Soon it split. A considerable proportion of the purchasers of national property having become rich, and supporting themselves no longer on the proletariat of the cities, but on the major portion of the peasants of France, these also having become landed proprietors, had no aspiration left but for peace, the re-establishment of public order, and the foundation of a strong and regular government. It therefore welcomed with joy the dictatorship of the first Bonaparte, and although always Voltairian, did not view with displeasure the Concordat with the Pope, and the re-establishment of the official church in France. Religion is so necessary to the people, which means that, satiated themselves, this portion of the bourgeoisie then began to see that it was needful to the maintenance of their situation and the preservation of their newly acquired estates to appease the unsatisfied hunger of the people by promises of heavenly manner. Then it was that Chateaubriand began to preach. Footnote It seems to me useful to recall at this point an anecdote one, by the way, well known and thoroughly authentic, which sheds a very clear light on the personal value of this warmed-over of the Catholic beliefs, and on the religious sincerity of that period. Chateaubriand submitted to a publisher a work attacking faith. The publisher called his attention to the fact that atheism had gone out of fashion, that the reading public cared no more for it, and that the demand, on the contrary, was for religious works. Chateaubriand withdrew, but a few months later came back with his genius of Christianity. End footnote. Napoleon fell, and the Restoration brought back into France the legitimate monarchy, and with it the power of the Church and of the nobles, who regained, if not the whole, at least a considerable portion of their former influence. This reaction threw the bourgeoisie back into the Revolution, and with the revolutionary spirit, that of scepticism, also was reawakened in it. It set Chateaubriand aside and began to read Voltaire again, but it did not go so far as Diderot. Its debilitated nerves could not stand nourishment so strong. Voltaire, on the contrary, at once a free thinker and a deist, suited it very well. Béranger and P. L. Courier expressed this new tendency perfectly. The God of the good people and the ideal of the bourgeois king, at once liberal and democratic, sketched against the majestic and thenceforth inoffensive background of the empire's gigantic victories, such was at that period the daily intellectual food of the bourgeoisie of France. Lamartine, to be sure, excited by a vain and ridiculously envious desire to rise to the poetic height of the great Byron, had begun his coldly delirious hymns in honour of the god of the nobles and of the legitimate monarchy, but his songs resounded only in aristocratic salons. The bourgeoisie did not hear them. Béranger was its poet, and Courier was its political writer. The revolution of July resulted in lifting its tastes. We know that every bourgeois in France carries within him the imperishable type of the bourgeois gentleman, a type which never fails to appear immediately the parvenu acquires a little wealth and power. 
In 1830, the wealthy bourgeoisie had definitely replaced the old nobility in the seats of power. It naturally tended to establish a new aristocracy. An aristocracy of capital, first of all, but also an aristocracy of intellect, of good manners and delicate sentiments. It began to feel religious. This was not, on its part, simply an aping of aristocratic customs. It was also a necessity of its position. The proletariat had rendered it a final service in once more aiding it to overthrow the nobility. The bourgeoisie now had no further need of its cooperation, for it felt itself firmly seated in the shadow of the throne of July, and the alliance with the people, thenceforth useless, began to become inconvenient. It was necessary to remand it to its place, which naturally could not be done without provoking great indignation among the masses. It became necessary to restrain this indignation. In the name of what? In the name of the bourgeois interest, bluntly confessed? That would have been much too cynical. The more unjust and inhuman an interest is, the greater need it has of sanction. Now, where find it, if not in religion, that good protectress of all the well-fed, and the useful consoler of the hungry. And more than ever, the triumphant bourgeoisie saw that religion was indispensable to the people. After having won all its titles to glory in religious, philosophical and political opposition, in protest and in revolution, it at last became the dominant class, and thereby even the defender and preserver of the state, Thenceforth, the regular institution of the exclusive power of that class. The state is force, and for it, first of all, is the right of force, the triumphant argument of the needle gun, of the chasse pot. But man is so singularly constituted that this argument, wholly eloquent as it may appear, is not sufficient in the long run. Some moral sanction or other is absolutely necessary to enforce his respect. Further, this sanction must be at once so simple and so plain that it may convince the masses who, after having been reduced by the power of the state, must also be induced to morally recognise its right. There are only two ways of convincing the masses of the goodness of any social institution whatever. The first, the only real one, but also the most difficult to adopt, because it implies the abolition of the state, or, in other words, the abolition of the organised political exploitation of the majority by any minority whatsoever, would be the direct and complete satisfaction of the needs and aspirations of the people, which would be equivalent to the complete liquidation of the political and economical existence of the bourgeois class, or, again, to the abolition of the state. Beneficial means for the masses but detrimental to bourgeois interests, hence it is useless to talk about them. The only way, on the contrary, harmful only to the people, precious in its salvation of bourgeois privileges, is no other than religion. That is the eternal mirage, which leads away the masses in a search for divine treasures, while much more reserved the governing class contents itself with dividing among all its members, very unequally moreover, and always giving most to him who possesses most, the miserable goods of earth and the plunder taken from the people, including their political and social liberty. There is not, there cannot be, a state without religion. Take the freest states in the world, the United States of America or the Swiss Confederation, for instance, and see what an important part is played in all official discourses by divine providence that supreme sanction of all states. But whenever a chief of state speaks of God, be he William I, the Nauto germanic Emperor, or Grant, the President of the Great Republic, be sure that he is getting ready to shear once more his people flock. The French liberal and Voltairean bourgeoisie, driven by temperament to a positivism, not to say a materialism, singularly narrow and brutal, having become the governing class of the state by its triumph of 1830, had to give itself an official religion. It was not an easy thing. The bourgeoisie could not abruptly go back under the yoke of Roman Catholicism. Between it and the Church of Rome was an abyss of blood and hatred, 
and however practical and wise one becomes, it is never possible to repress a passion developed by history. Moreover, the French bourgeoisie would have covered itself with ridicule if it had gone back to the church to take part in the pious ceremonies of its worship, an essential condition of a meritorious and sincere conversion. Several attempted it, it is true, but their heroism was rewarded by no other result than a fruitless scandal. Finally, a return to Catholicism was impossible on account of the insolvable contradiction which separates the invariable politics of Rome from the development of the economical and political interests of the middle class. In this respect, Protestantism is much more advantageous. It is the bourgeois religion par excellence. It accords just as much liberty as is necessary to the bourgeois and finds a way of reconciling celestial aspirations with the respect which terrestrial conditions demand. Consequently, it is especially in Protestant countries that commerce and industry have been developed. But it was impossible for the French bourgeoisie to become Protestant, to pass from one religion to another, unless it be done deliberately, as sometimes is the case of the Jews of Russia and Poland, who get baptised three or four times in order to receive each time the remuneration allowed them. To seriously change one's religion, a little faith is necessary. Now, in the exclusive positive heart of the French bourgeois, there is no room for faith. He professes the most profound indifference for all questions which touch neither his pocket first, nor his social vanity afterwards. He is as indifferent to Protestantism as to Catholicism, on the other hand, the French bourgeois could not go over to Protestantism without putting himself in conflict with the Catholic routine of the majority of French people, which would have been great imprudence on the part of a class pretending to govern the nation. There was still one way left, to return to the humanitarian and revolutionary religion of the 18th century. But that would have led too far so the bourgeoisie was obliged, in order to sanction its new state, to create a new religion, which might be boldly proclaimed, without too much ridicule and scandal, by the whole bourgeois class. Thus was born doctrinaire deism. Others have told, much better than I could tell it, the story of the birth and development of this school, which had so decisive and, we may well add, so fatal an influence on the political, intellectual and moral education of the bourgeois youth of France. It dates from Benjamin Constant and Madame de Stael. Its real founder was Royer Collard. Its apostles, Guizot, Cousin, Vilma and many others. Its boldly avowed object was the reconciliation of revolution with reaction or, to use the language of the school, of the principle of liberty with that of authority, and naturally to the advantage of the latter. This reconciliation signified, in politics, the taking away of popular liberty for the benefit of bourgeois rule, represented by the monarchical and constitutional state, in philosophy the deliberate submission of free reason to the eternal principles of faith. We have only to deal here with the latter. We know that this philosophy was specially elaborated by Monsieur Cousin, the father of French eclecticism, a superficial and pedantic talker incapable of any original conception, of any idea peculiar to himself, but very strong on commonplace, which he confounded with common sense. This illustrious philosopher learnedly prepared for the use of the studious youth of France a metaphysical dish of his own making, the use of which, made compulsory in all schools of the state under the university, condemned several generations, one after the other, to a cerebral indigestion. Imagine a philosophical vinegar sauce of the most opposed systems, a mixture of fathers of the church, scholastic philosophers, Descartes and Pascal, Kant and Scotch psychologists, all this a superstructure on the divine and innate ideas of Plato, and covered up with a layer of Hegelian eminence, accompanied, of course, by an ignorance, as contemptuous as it is complete, of natural science, and proving just as two times two make five, the existence of a personal God. 
End of God and the State by Mikhail Bakunin Read by Carl Manchester, 2007This has been a LibriVox recording. It was edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchists.